real love and respect for Julian and wrote an autobiography of him really close to the end of her own life. So um, here's Mary, Australian, knows she's Australian, knows something else needs to be for Australia and penned a letter to a mentor in Rome making clear that for Australia um, the approach that was right in Europe would be really quite different here. She said, it's an Australian who writes, one brought up in the midst of the evil she tries to describe. She knew her time and place. Maybe she even knew the story of the weeks of her birth. Um, her cousin Duncan McNabb um, came to Australia, perhaps because of letters from his aunt and uncle. Especially, Scottish priest wanted to work with Aboriginal people. So um, she could see that she she could see um, here there were the people in the outback, the Aboriginal people, the people in the slums. Uh, she was looking for long-term solutions, not just immediate what could happen. And really, education was the thing that she really lit upon, and Julian also. Good quality, free education for families who couldn't pay. And um, that talked about the bush children and the infected poor. So as, as these congregation Sisters of St. Joseph's Free, it really wasn't just the sisters. You know, some people say, tell us what the sisters are doing now, and it's really how many people in how many different ways are working in this kind of spirit. It's the kind of spirit that says, look at what's happening around us. Really, sift it, judge it, how is it? There really are things where there are moral ambiguities. You don't know which or which, but how do you gradually, gradually discern what is the right way forward from that? But do it really listening on the ground with people who are poorest and that was her way of doing it. Um, for instance, for instance, here's, the, here's a great Melbourne story. In 1891, at the age of 49, after she'd been deposed really from leadership of the congregation, um, Mary came back to Melbourne and she came back at a time of a global financial crisis, actually a crash. Melbourne was built on gold and it is judged that probably Melbourne crashed harder than any other city in the world. It was vastly affected by the depression. And after being involved in country school in Yumurka and uh, Bacchus Marsh, which was country, um, the Archbishop Carr, who I think had a great feel for Joe's social justice, we didn't have Archbishop problems the way Mary had had in other places in Bathurst and in Queensland and in South Australia. Archbishop Carr said to Mary, look, um, it's desperate. People are, are really worried for the destitute and the desperate, especially in the worst bit of Melbourne, which was, again, boomerang throw from here, same place. The block between um, Exhibition, Spring, Little Lonsdale, and Petrobe. It was a festering slum. It was where you went, really, if you had nowhere else to go. Um, it was um, the toughest part of Melbourne. Um, it was always known to be deplorable. Earlier on, the artist had described it as a disgrace to the city and an even greater disgrace to the police. So here we were with this place down here. And um, during the Depression at its worst, but CJ Dennis wrote about, and I can't resist the temptation of reading it to you, but um, CJ Dennis writing about little lines, me that has done me stretch for Stouch and Johns and spends me leisure getting on the ship and half me nights down there in little lines with ginger me, just adding them and doing in me guilt, Luck. I suppose that's our man's built. <laughs> um, the Archbishop simply told Mary that while the need was overwhelming, 
one would have to live in the area to do something about it and he wouldn't ask the sisters to live there. So of course, I think he was very clear, predictably she said, we'll go. <laughs> so she and one other sister, Gertrude, um, moved down to Little Lawns and uh, rented a place and um, set out um, to manage a house for homeless servant girls because you don't keep your servants if you lost your money. And uh, so the girls who had been servants were on the street. Soup kitchen and clothes desk distribution in the backyard and night school for street children. It's really strange. I was, I was in Peru at the time of a huge economic crash and in a, in a, in a slum in um, Nova Esperanza. And um, they're exactly the same. Like people woke up in the morning, it was a slump, they, they were living day to day, the money in their pocket wasn't enough to feed their children tomorrow. And so they rolled up their sleeves and the sisters rolled up their sleeves with them and they started a shelter for those who were homeless. They started a soup kitchen. They went around the markets with baskets and gathered up whatever you could get to make soup. And, um, and uh, a little bit of night school for the um, children. And exactly the same thing. Not, not from reading Melbourne, just from knowing that you, you just have to do what you have to do. So they call this place the Providence because there were no government grants. There was no money, whatever, just the thought that God would provide. So going down to the market with big bags and seeing who would give you a cabbage or a pumpkin or something to make things thin, it really got us a pretty bad name of unrespectable people. But it continued right to my time that we did that kind of thing and still does in lots of places of this world. Um, so that was exactly where she was and what she was doing when Leo was writing Rirum Navarum. <laughs> she was just down here. She had, didn't hear about it. Because after that she took off by coach and train around Melbourne because she'd been working with the youngsters at Surrey Hills. And um, a lot of them had been fostered to country families. So she was doing a one night, night stop in country places. Um, visiting. And there's a diary, somebody's discovered a diary, and uh, after an entry that says, saw our boy, he's doing well, uh, comes one that says, the Bishop of Sandhurst told me about a new decree, and it was Rerum Novarum. I'm just wondering what she would have made of it, if she read it, would she think of the Eureka Stockade, would she think of the Eight Hours Day, what would she think, what were we? So it was, um, it was always not, not um, like they, they said, no fine ladyism about it. You're in among the people, you're listening there. Um, to encounter God in the many faces of poor people, to learn from them, to receive from them, and to support them in their struggle for justice and equity. So it was a distinctive way of living the gospel, just the courage and toughness to live creatively in a pioneering situation. I think we still need it. The endurance to face vilification and persecution without bitterness or blame. The serenity to, make, to remain confident that God would provide when new ventures were manifestly risky. The tenderness to listen to children and to the poorest of people. And it was all of that. It was a way of living the gospel that somehow picked up Australian values that were brewing there. There was no generation before her to show her the way. I call it an unmapped place of the spirit. And she said, lean on God. And it just seems to me that God's spirit wove the threads of her circumstances into this fabric that was resilient enough and maybe resilient enough for our times as well as her tough times. Mary's spirituality and her gritty involvement with life were in no way separate. It was really gritty involvement too. When she was at Surrey Hill, she said, send me some more sisters. Sure, they've got to have a compassionate heart, but they better have the stomach for it too. It's tough. <laughs> and it was gritty. 
But she said, God's presence seems to follow me everywhere I go and makes all I do or wish to do a prayer. To understand this is really to understand the decision she made. Mary experienced God among the people as she just wept with their tragedies and, and rejoiced with their, 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 their triumphs. And she said, there where you are, you will find God. So it wasn't a separate thing for her life of justice. It was the two things together. She wouldn't readily talk about her personal experience of God. She said to her mother, I don't want to be egotistical, which is a little bit Australian too, I think. And um, as it was with the first people of this land, Mary lived her life listening for the Spirit of God. She said to me, the will of God is a dear book that I'm never tired of reading. And I was talking to Miriam Rose, you know, a tribal woman from the centre of Australia, and she's just written, what I want to talk about is another special quality of my people. I believe it is most important. It is our unique gift. It is perhaps the greatest gift we can give to our fellow Australians. In our language, this quality is called a deary. It is inner, deep listening and quiet awareness. We call on it and it calls on us. This is the gift that Australians are thirsting for. Now, um, I, I was amazed at what happened in October um, around the canonisation. I, I, was, I wasn't in Rome, I was here. And um, because I was here, I was logged with a lot of reporters. I didn't see anything or hear anything, but my sister tells me it was pretty constant. It was certainly constant. This is what struck me. Uh, this, uh, there are a couple of young journalists sort of following me around. They say, Joan, you know, this station, this FM station, which I've never heard of in my life and probably would never listen to its music, they want to talk to you live on air. Now get on, and they'd say, hold a minute, we're doing an ad. Joan, we're doing an ad. And then suddenly, like off air, these people would start talking about God, <laughs> or their own spirituality, or their own search, or their own faith, or their own loss of it, or whatever. I had, I had a letter from a young journalist saying, after this experience of covering this story, I will never be the same again. She didn't have to write to me. Like, and, and sitting all, all made up and blow-drived in, in, a, in, in a studio, waiting while ads and ads and ads and ads go on, everybody around you was telling you the story. The story, like, so I think Miriam Rose is right. There is something that people are longing for. And it's something that's sort of uniquely out of this land, this, this place, this, this, this time. Um, just I, I, on the weekend, I watched a long segment of unedited footage that somebody got out of the studio for us from October the 17th. And I, was, I was nearly moved to tears. There was this great surge of people coming along Gertrude Street. Well, Gertrude Street is, this, for one thing, it's close to Mary's birthplace, but it's right along by um, Charcoal Lane. And the, the whole Aboriginal, urban Aboriginal meeting place of Melbourne. And in the lead was an Aboriginal message stick. And then little children with balloons and flowers, everybody, ethnic groups with banners and the music from their land. And there were, of course, bagpipes and people marching to it down by Charcoal Lane, past the buildings that pretty much dated back to Mary's birth. And sometimes the camera went down and just focused on the feet. And there were moccasins coming along, and a lot of us have worked in Broadway, we'd say, wow, yes, moccasins, <laughs> moccasins, boots, high heels, thongs, little silver slippers someone had on, children's feet, and I just 